Is it just me, or was last season kind of a letdown for TCU? Yeah, that's what I thought. I mean, six and seven? Something we're not used to seeing at Fort Worth under a Gary Patterson-type team. After all, in 2014 and 2015, the two seasons before that, TCU was a whopping 23-3 and and won a major bowl game in 2014, and that same year, a share of the Big 12 championship. Last season's team just showed way too much inconsistency on offense, and defensively, they bended too much, and the secondary had to deal with a series of injuries. So no wonder it was a mediocre year for the guys from Fort Worth. So Texas Christian entering the 2017 season, well, they should be better, at least if you look at it on paper, because they returned a ton of starters and a lot of senior leadership. And that will include offensively Kyle Hicks, who amassed over 1,000 yards on the ground in 2016, also had 12 touchdowns. But he also, too, returns as the team's leading receiver with 47 catches. Wow, so Kyle Hicks, we'll see if he gets even more touches in 2017 than what he saw last season. Darius Anderson will back him up, a sophomore. Now, I'm not saying that Gary Patterson, the head coach of the Horned Frogs, made wholesale changes during the offseason as far as offense, but there was some reshuffling as far as the assistant coaches went. For example, uh, Jared Anderson, who was the offensive line coach, now is the inside receiver coach. And a guy by the name of Curtis Looper, who was the running backs coach, now is the co-offensive coordinator along with Sonny Cumbie. Back for another year, but this time Cumbie will take more of a role as far as play calling goes. Now, for the past few years, as you know, it had been the Sonny Cumbie doug Beecham show, and they were responsible for some explosive offenses these past few years for TCU. Of course, last year's offense had their struggles. Now, Meacham is the offensive coordinator at Kansas. So it will become Sonny Cumbie and Curtis Looper's offense for the Horn Frogs. And another um, thing to talk about, too, for TCU, Sonny Dykes. You might remember him, the former Cal head coach. Well, he now will be a part of the TCU staff as an offensive analyst or consultant, if you will. So that should aid Kenny Hill a little bit, who's had an up-and-down college career. Of course, Kenny Hill, the quarterback, Three years ago, played for Texas A&M, started well that year, but then struggled, lost his starting position. Last year, there was some good and bad with Kenny Hill. First the good, uh, 17 touchdown passes. Also, too, was an effective runner. Bad news, though, way too many mistakes, way too many bad decisions. In fact, 13 interceptions. That's excessive. And not to his fault, though, 36 drop passes. No quarterback had more drop passes last year in college football than Kenny Hill. So the receivers really need to step up their game. Good news for TCU, they have a lot of veterans at uh, receiver. Now, TCU will play a lot of four receiver sets, and Toss Williams, he's hopeful for a better year, had 39 catches a year ago, averaged 18 yards per catch, and had five touchdowns. So you know the potential's there for Williams. Another senior starter, you have Joe D'Arcy, had 33 catches in 2016. And Emmanuel Porter, another senior, started five games a year ago and running out the receiving lineup for TCU, a junior in Cavante Turpin, who also was an effective kick returner, has returned to kickoff for a touchdown in each of his first two seasons. The offensive line, a lot of leadership in this department. Every starter back but one, that will include uh, Joseph Noteboom, a senior at left tackle, has started 26 consecutive games. Also, too, Matt Pryor at right guard, a senior who has, you know, been productive. In fact, played all 13 games last year and started in them. And Austin Shalotman, a center who played and started in 11 games in 2016. Now, the position of left guard, two-way battle. Patrick Morse, you can go with him as a senior. Or sophomore, whose stock seems to be on the rise in Cordell Iwagu. And the one position we really don't know about, right tackle, right now the projected starter is a sophomore in Lucas Niang. Last season's Horn Frog team um, had 463 yards of total offense per game. That's not bad if you look at the nationwide scene in the Big 12, where the yardage and the points are at a premium. It was only seventh best in the league. Now, one thing, though, the TCU could help themselves in is red zone offense. A year ago, this was a team that got inside the opponent's 20-yard line 60 times. That's right, 60, but only came away with touchdowns 33 of the 60 times. So that's an area that should, if TCU plays their cards right, see a little bit of improvement. A year ago, they averaged 31 points per game. But remember, the year before, they averaged 42 points per contest. But again, they have a lot of players back on the offensive side of the ball. 
Defensively, Chad Glasgow's defense knows that that defensive line will see a lot of new faces as far as full-time starters. They lost three dandies. We're talking about James McFarland, Josh Carraway at the defensive ends, and Eric Curry at a defensive tackle. They were three very good players. The only returning starter you have back on that front four is Chris Bradley, a senior who started in nine of the 13 games a year ago and had 30 tackles. Now, the other defensive tackle, Joseph Brodnax, he did play in 12 of the 13 games, missed the Liberty Bowl, but did start in three games, had 23 tackles. As far as the defensive ends, a guy that could really see his stock rise is Max Borson, a senior who had six sacks a year ago, 6'4", and 235. And the other defensive end, I think they're getting excited about this transfer from Louisiana Monroe. We're talking about uh, Ben uh, Banagoom, a guy that you know two years ago at Louisiana Monroe really made an impact for that team. Had to sit out last year because of the transfer rule, though. But uh, his presence will be very much welcome. Uh, ben uh, Banagoo, a junior. So looking at the linebackers as TCU plays that 4-2-5 alignment, Linebackers are the best in the Big 12 and one of the best units in the country. I'm talking about a couple of guys that combined for 251 tackles a year ago. First team all Big 12 player in Traven Howard is going to have a shot at All-American this season. 130 stops a year ago, and he looks like he's got one bright future coming up as far as the National Football League, the next level. He's a senior and a junior in Ty Summers, had 121 tackles a year ago, and was second team all Big 12 last season. You have also Montreal Wilson and Sammy Douglas as quality backups for the TCU unit. The secondary, this was an injury riddle area last year, and they were at times vulnerable as a result, but they're healthy and ready to go right now. All but one of their starters is back. They lost Denzel Johnson to safety, but they do return um, just about everybody else. Um, you've got returning at a corner in um, Ranthony Tejada who had 46 tackles a year ago, started every game last year except for one. The other corner, you have uh, Jeff Gladley, just a sophomore, eight starts a year ago. They could also use uh, Julius Lewis as well. Safeties stacked in this area despite the loss of Johnson. You have at uh, weak safety, Nick Orr led the team in interceptions in 2016 with four. He's a senior and also another senior in Nico Small, five feet 10 inches tall. So is he small? Kind of, but he does play big at free safety. He had 83 tackles a year ago and started in 12 of the 13 games. And running out the TCU secondary at strong safety, you have Ridwan Izahoku, a junior who played 12 games last year and got two starts and had 24 tackles. As far as the special teams go, well, as far as field goal kicking, they went with multiple kickers in 2016. Went 18 of 25, but a couple of those games at least were costly with missed field goals at the end, and they end up being overtime losses to both Arkansas and to Texas Tech, both games at home. So we'll see if Brandon Hatfield is still the place kicker. As far as I've heard, after the spring, it could go to any one of four kickers right now, so stay tuned on that. Looking at the Horned Frog schedule, it gets real serious starting week number two for Texas Christian, a road game against the SEC's Arkansas Razorbacks. As I mentioned earlier, Arkansas beat TCU last year in Fort Worth overtime. Oklahoma State, Kansas State, and Oklahoma, three schools that TCU has not fared very well against the last three years, a combined four wins and 11 losses. you got to play all three schools this year away from Amon Gene Carter Stadium. So it will not be easy. September 23rd is the Big 12 opener in Stillwater against the Pokes and October 14th against KSU. But at least you get West Virginia, Kansas, Texas, and Baylor all at home. For some reason, Kansas plays TCU very competitive. In fact, last year's game, TCU was lucky to get out with a one-point win at Lawrence. But at least you get them at Fort Worth this time. The Oklahoma game is November the 11th. The last five years, which has been all five years that TCU has existed in the Big 12, the team that's won this game has only won it by seven points or less, including last year, in which TCU almost came back from a 25-point fourth-quarter deficit, only to lose to the Sooners by six points. Vegas has TCU at 7.5 wins. Yeah, Vegas knows something, and I was thinking seven wins or eight. I'm going to say eight. Eight wins. Okay, I'm going to say eight wins. I don't think they'll get the job done against the Oklahoma schools or against Kansas State. 
Arkansas is going to be a bit of a challenge as well. But I do think they'll handle the rest of the competition. It will be an improved season for TCU, but I don't have them contending for the Big 12 championship. That's my look at Texas Christian. We'll catch you next time.